What's up, kin folk? It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. Welcome to the number one ranked show. Please, since you are here, rate the podcast. Leave five stars. It really helps other people discover the audio version of the podcast. And we are wherever it is that you listen to your podcast, obviously. And we're also on YouTube where you can subscribe to the number one ranked show with RJ Young. And you can follow us on the social medias at number one show on Twitter at the number one on IG and at the number show, number one show on Facebook. Again, wherever it is that you are on the socials, wherever it is you are on the podcast, and of course on the YouTubes. And we get to talk with Jake Olson, who is the president of Engage. We get a name, image, and likeness, and we get into his story. And not a whole hell of a lot of people get to say that they lettered in president of their own company that is also doing gangbusters just five years apart really great conversation with Jake and I was grateful to have him on the show and since we are on the topic of name image and likeness this moments after the NCAA's name image and likenesses policy went into effect on July 1 players began signing deals the policy has four major points according to the NCAA individuals can engage in NIL activities that are consistent with the law of the state where the school is located Colleges and universities may be a resource for state law questions. College athletes who attend a school in a state without an NIL law can engage in this type of activity without violating NCAA rules related to name, image, and likeness. Individuals can use a professional services provider for NIL activities like Engage. Student athletes should report NIL activities consistent with state law or school and conference requirements to their school. That's a big one. And a way they went and we're going to talk about them but first i want to talk about reggie bush or more pointedly reggie bush's heisman following the enactment of the ncaa's nil policy many bush included asked when the heisman trust you know was going to give the man his heisman back and it looks like they're going to make us get on our torrance marshall in the 2000 national title game in response to public pressure about this the heisman trust released the following statement on July 2nd, I am going to quote it in full, quote, the Heisman Trust believes the recent decision by the NCAA to allow student athletes the ability to control their name, image, and likeness is a positive step in the right direction. The Heisman Trust supports any legislation that will protect and benefit all student athletes. The on-field accomplishments of Reggie Bush during the 2005 season at USC were remarkable and remain in the memories of all college football fans that had the privilege of witnessing him in action. Subsequent to Bush being awarded the 2005 Heisman Trophy, the NCAA excuse me, concluded an investigation that he and his family had received impermissible benefits while a student athlete at the University of South Southern California and vacated his playing records as well as those of the entire USC football team. In September of 2010, Bush announced that he would forfeit his title as a Heisman Trophy winner and the Heisman Trust vacated the 2005 award. Bush returned his trophy and USC returned its replica trophy to the Heisman Trust. The Heisman Trophy ballot used by voters has a rule governing eligibility for the award, which was in effect in 2005, which states, in order, that there will be no misunderstanding regarding the eligibility of a candidate the recipient of the award must be a bona fide student of an accredited college or university including the united states academies the recipient must be in compliance with the bylaws defining an ncaa student athlete bush's 2005 season records remain vacated by the ncaa and as a result under the rules set forth by the heisman trust and stated on the Heisman ballot, he is not eligible to be awarded the 2005 Heisman Memorial Trophy. Should the NCAA reinstate Bush's 2005 status, the Heisman Trust looks forward to welcoming him back to the Heisman family. The Heisman Trophy Trust is a charitable organization dedicated to improving educational and athletic opportunities for the underserved youth in our communities and preserving the integrity of the Heisman Trophy, end quote. All to say, it's a bad rule. Now, for his part, Bush said he never cheated this game. But that's not my point about any of this. My point is the Heisman Trust looks bad for its bad rule, and it doesn't have to. First, 
We all knew that Bush won the 2005 Heisman Trophy. Second, Heisman Trust's reasoning smacks of hypocrisy. In 1970, Nebraska's Johnny Rogers was arrested and charged for armed robbery. He and two friends held up a gas station in Lincoln, Nebraska and got 90 bucks. Rogers later pleaded guilty to a lesser charge, but was a felon when he won the 1972 Heisman Trophy. Then, 40 years after winning the 1968 Heisman, O.J. Simpson was convicted for armed robbery and kidnapping. But the Heisman Trust let both Rogers and Simpson keep their Heismans. Why not just give Reggie his back? While you ponder that, ponder this. Matter of fact, while we're trying to give Reggie his Heisman back, let's push for vacated seasons and years on probation to be reinstated while we trying to get Brittany out of her conservatorship instead of continuing to treat these years, you know, the programs got these NCAA felony charges like we do Brittany's year in 2007. But RJ, are there that many programs that had whole seasons vacated or were placed on probation in college football? Ooh, child. I got a list of them like Eminem. Here's the order of my list that it's in. It goes USC, Reggie, Florida, and then Miami. Alabama, Carolina, Oklahoma does not surprise me. Ohio State, Florida State, and Orange Power U, Colorado, Houston, and SMU's Sherwood Blood saying, we got a payroll to meet too. Penn State, Washington, Ampersand U, I want to see UCLA said what we say. We're trying to get back what's ours from you. Your favorite player at your favorite school is open for biz. While you ponder that, the U is shirtless on South Beach with real gold grill and a diamond rope chain. Talking about, I'm about to plunder this. An MMA gym wants to sign all 90 existing Miami Hurricanes to a deal that could net each of them 6,000 this year. And a Nebraska restaurant wants to do something similar with the Huskers. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you bring back Nebraska football and the U. Why? Because that's a damn payroll, all right? You ain't fooling nobody. Look, what I'm saying is, cue up Cool Mo D, Drew Hill, and Will Smith because it's the wild, wild west, all right? And this is just the start. It's also what should happen. Players making money off their name, image, and likeness is a fundamental civil liberty, a right. It is our right to enter into a contract for services, and no one, especially descendants of slavery like me, take that lightly just like the ability to name ourselves. We do not take lightly. It's also the start of the professionalization of the sport, which is long overdue. Hasten the day when players not only make money from NIL, but are paid a competitive salary from their employers, the universities and conferences themselves. College football is a $5 billion industry and everyone is making money but the players. Indeed, there are those detractors. In 2014, Clemson coach Dabo Sweeney famously told the Charleston Post and Courier, quote, we try to teach our guys, use football to create opportunities, take advantage of the platform and the brand and the marketing you have available to you. But as far as paying players, professionalizing college athletics, that's where you lose me. I'll go do something else because there's enough entitlement in this world as it is. End quote. In 2019, Dabo Sweeney signed a 10-year, $93 million contract. Pot, meat, kettle. And education does not directly equate to money in your pocket. How you use it does. And a college degree is only as good as the job you can get with it. I got a master's in professional writing. What do I do for a living? Where most of these men in college football want to go, the NFL, requires no such thing as a degree. And for many of them, this is the most profitable period in their lives. To say nothing of the non-revenue generating sports like women's gymnastics, where some women will now get to leverage their social media followings that, in at least one case, number more than a million. LSU Tiger gymnast Olivia Dunn counts a TikTok following of 3.9 million and an IG following of 1.1 million for a total of 5 million accounts paying attention to what she does. Teddy KGB that woman. Pay that woman. Pay that woman her money. Look, in football, the television contracts are going up. The SEC is getting $3 billion for the rights to show its players who create the product from the four-letter network. In my college football fantasy, a college football players union would strike a deal to get half that money pooled for the labor force. And then the sport would become a, de yes, a destination one like the NFL, MLB, or NBA. No sports won't generate as much money as the NFL, not college anyway. 
but it'll get close. To wit, the NBA generated nearly $9 billion in 2018-2019 fiscal year. College football might be worth that, just, you know, an expansion of the playoff alone, if we're talking about 12, let alone 16. The more money that goes into the player's pocket, the more competitive the sport can be, not only to retain talent, but to increase it. You wouldn't see many players opting out of playing in a bowl game if there was a substantial check on the line for playing in it. And the likelihood of mid-draft players electing to leave early for the NFL might actually go down, especially if they're getting big money and endorsement deals. Phil Knight played the big joker out the box, partnering Nike with Kayvon Thibodeau and Tinker Friggin Hatfield on a six-year, six-figure deal. Good Lord. Texas A&M running back Isaiah Spiller, though, posted on IG that his post-workout meal, meal is fueled by a fried chicken joint. He was pictured with a styrofoam to-go box of fried chicken and french fries, leading me to wonder how Aggie strength coach Jerry Schmidt feels about this. Oklahoma quarterback Spencer Rattler also signed a deal with the same fried chicken joint Spiller did. But he also looked like the player with the marketing team that has been preparing for the age of name, image, and likeness for years. Many of you have seen the personal logo design made for his brand that is a snaked S that only inspires more questions, man. But this also goes to show just how prepared for NIL, the athletic department, let alone the football program at OU has been. In 2019, when many of us believed NIL was no longer an if but a when, OU's graphics team made logos for each of its incoming 2020 recruits. That's right. They all have one, and many of them look exactly like what you might expect a teenager to come up with. Again, Spencer, that snake. <laughs> There's also deals with apparel companies. Michigan Safety, Dax Hill, has a clothing line that features his logo in partnership with an apparel company. So did Wisconsin Graham, uh, quarterback, excuse me, Graham Mertz. So did Texas teammates Josh Thompson and DeMarvion Overshone. So did Georgia QB Brock Vandergriff. Arkansas wideout Trey Knox inked a deal with a pet supply company. Jackson State's Antoine Owen signed with a grooming company and had what many believe is the first deal, but more on that in a little bit. And then there's Derek King, who signed four deals in the first 10 hours of the new policy's enactment. LSU DB Derek Stingley Jr. signed with a restaurant. A gaming company has deals with Notre Dame teammates Kyle Hamilton and Kyron Williams. Bo Nix signed with a beverage company. If you're not or if you are, I should say, into sending camera film videos to your friends as gifts, you can now ask a college football player to do just that for a fee. Texas running back B. John Robinson is going to do that for you for $150. However, an unintended consequence of this has already reared its head. An Oklahoma fan, my buddy Brett, shout out to Brett who listens to the show, sent $150 to Robinson asking him to sing Boomer Sooner for his video. Robinson politely denied that request, but he made the video. Anyway, shoot your shot. Rattler will do it for $125. Nebraska's quarterback Adrian Martinez will do it for $80. Ohio State DB7 Banks will do it for $70. UCLA quarterback Dorian Thompson Robinson charges $60. Iowa State running back Brees Hall charges $50. So does Texas QB Casey Thompson, who claims he'll use the money to combat child hunger. Hamilton, Kyle Hamilton, charges $49, as does Tennessee quarterback Joe Milton. Penn State quarterback Sean Clifford is hitting for 30, and Alabama DB Malachi Moore is hitting for 25. So after all that, if it sounds like the kids are about to get a real-time, very public education on peer-to-peer -peer marketing, conversion rates, and the effect of your personal beliefs on selling your product in a capitalistic quasi-free market system, that's because they are. Look, I work on the internet. I have been working in a digital first affiliate marketing system for most of my adult life. And guess what? It ain't always fun. Nothing like finding out that, you know, you're a part of a pyramid scheme to make you change your worldview on economics. What I'm saying is some of y'all remember moms coming home tired and cranky as hell because Naisha and Rita ain't want to buy no Tupperware or Precious and Tanisha ain't want that Mary Kay because it makes the face break out. What I'm telling y'all is, oh yeah, your children is going to learn the hard way. And I'm here to laugh at all the ways that this goes right and all the ways that this goes wrong. All right. Now, let's talk to Jake. Jake, how you doing, man? RJ, how's it going? I'm going. It's, it's 
awesome over here because it's a new day in college football. And one of the things I really love about my job and doing the sport is the ways in which it pushes forward begrudgingly most of the time, modernization, both on the field and off the field. But one of the reasons that I wanted to speak with you is we are now at the very beginning of name, image, and likeness as a policy enacted yep. by the NCAA. And you have a company called Engage that helps facilitate some of these transactions. Can you tell us more about it? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I found it Engage my junior year of college, actually. So even before I graduated, and that was due to the fact that I had been speaking for such a long time. And frankly, I was probably one of the only college athletes um, that could continue to make money via name image likeness to an extent while I still was in college. And the reason I could do that is because of a USC athlete before me, a little Romeo who played basketball um, had the NCAA kind of create this, this double life clause where basically if you were famous or if you were well known for something entirely different or entirely separate from your athletics, uh, especially your, you know, the athlete athletics that you play for college football um, or for college athletics, then you could continue to make money doing that. Even if you were a football player, so long as you didn't get more famous or you didn't upcharge, you know, because of your newfound popularity playing that sport. So for me, I had been speaking since the age of 12 about, you know, overcoming cancer and overcoming blindness. So as I went into USC, it was like, hey, can I continue these speaking engagements? They said, well, yes, you can. However, you cannot, again, upcharge. All of a sudden, you can't be making, you know, double what you were before. And you also can't be marketed ever as, you know, a college athlete, USC's long snapper, yada, yada, yada. So I was still able to make money doing speaking engagements and appearances while in college. And it was because of that that I finally hit this breaking point with my manager because we were getting a lot of requests that, my manager said, Hey man, we just need to find an easier way for people to one, reach out to you and find out who's legitimate when they do reach out to you, but also let's streamline this process. And really we didn't find any platform out there that was, was capable of what we wanted or really gave us anything close to, to a real efficient way of, of event fielding requests and, and completing requests. And so we created uh, found a very, Fortunately, found investors that were willing to help us build the platform. We built it out and we, we started this business engaged. And so really, it's a platform online that helps any type of talent. But obviously, you know, athletes kind of given our space, um, basically be booked for any type of appearance, you know, and experience um, and, and, and do what they love, making money, doing what they love. And so that really has kind of been our bread and butter for the last three years, two years. Um, and then as soon as NIL opened up, it was like, Hey, here's a whole nother field of, of athletes. And here's a whole nother field of individuals who are now allowed to make money. I mean, it really ties in exactly what we built the platform for. And that is we built the platform originally for individuals who are making money kind of in that five, 10, 15,000 range, because, RJ, agents will not spend the time curating or taking care of requests if it's not worth the commission they're making on it. Um, and so a lot of times agents will have clients that they never even spend a, a second on because they're just, I mean, ask yourself, RJ, if you, if you were an agent and you were going to make a commission off a $200,000 deal or a $20,000 deal, what are you going to spend time doing? And so we really kind of created this platform to be more efficient so those smaller deals can be made. Well, guess what? Most of the 99.9% .9 of these now NIL deals are going to be in that price range where agents and agencies don't have the capacity or the time to efficiently uh, curate those deals. Well, guess what? The online platform, as any technology does, really makes that efficient. No, man, you're 100% correct. Like this is a capitalistic quasi free market system and we're going to go where the loot is and the loot is in commission on 200K and not 20K. But I think you bring up an, a, a very interesting point here because local marketing is robust. And yes. I come up in local sports talk radio, right? I am very much ingrained in my city. It's Tulsa. I went to high school here. I went to the university here for undergrad. So I pay close attention and you could see Jason White, former Heisman Trophy winner, right? On a billboard selling air conditioning. Like it's right. a big part of it. But my real question for you and engage is what is the difference between engage and say a speakers bureau? 
Right. So it's the efficiency. It, it really is the efficiency. We, we've talked to speaker bureaus um, and there's people in speaker bureaus that are just so frustrated with kind of how they're stuck in their ways. But the problem is speaker bureaus still make money doing what they're doing. So they don't, they don't have any incentive to really change. Right. Um, but the, the thing is, is it takes three, four, five people to have to intake a deal, to go legal through a deal, to do the contract, to contact the person, to set up all this stuff. It literally takes us no, it takes us half the time, maybe even a fourth of the time, not as many people touching the deal. It's all through the platform. They speaker bureaus will not touch deals under, I'd say probably $15,000, most of them, because they, the time it takes and the amount of work it takes with people, it, they don't get any commission off of it. They don't get any revenue off of it because it just takes too many people. So that's one of the problems. The other problem is, and this is kind of, I guess, just the industry as a whole. And this is where we really wanted to kind of come in and clean things up as well. Unfortunately, a lot of speaker bureaus out there name a lot of people they don't represent. They just put names on their on their website. And what's going to happen is someone's going to say, hey, I want RJ Young to come speak to our company. RJ Young, the, the, that speaker bureau doesn't represent you. So they're going to say, oh, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, we'll reach out to them. You know, they'll, they'll waste a week or two, say, yeah, we're contacting them. And then they'll say, hey, hey, uh, RJ is not available, actually. But here is uh, Kurt Herbstreit, right? So all of a sudden, RJ, you never knew that deal was even coming to you. They didn't even contact you. They just wanted that that intake uh, form so that basically they could just do a switch and say, hey, RJ is not available, but here's someone we do represent. So based on that, it's just there's a lot of dishonesty and a lot of kind of middling going on. And we really wanted to say, hey, let's make this transparent. Let's make this honest. Everyone we represent on our platform, either we know directly or know their agent directly deals directly with that talent. So anything that comes through is going directly to their email inbox. You know that we're not touching anything or, or doing a switch swap or whatever. Um, it is totally transparent and honest. Well, and selling transparency for me is a tremendous selling point because authenticity and honesty are the two things in digital, which we are really is our stock and trade. Like I'm I'm getting off into a tangent when I say this, but the kids are about to find out what affiliate marketing is really like and what those conversion rates are really like whenever yes. they're saying use a promo code or whatnot. Right. But where I think you're interesting for me and your, I should say your company is interesting for me is I'm one of these people, right? And I've been reached out to and, and it's gone bad or been reached out to and I've been skipped over and I've been asking like, what's going on here? So the idea that you have fewer hands, but also that you see everything, I think it's going to be a tremendous selling point for your players. To that end, have you had some college football players uh, sign up for Engage or that you've recruited to Engage? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it did not take long. And I think uh, we are going to be making a, a couple announcements pretty soon with some, some bigger players both in college football, um, definitely in college basketball, a couple of other sports as well. Again, there's just a lot of things that we can do more than, um, you know, back to your question, what makes us different than Speakers Bureau? We, we have a lot of other kind of verticals that also make us really creative and, and uh, innovative in our, in our space, including doing kind of sweepstakes. We've done a ton of sweepstakes with professional athletes that can just obviously be done with college athletes now. These are basically... A college athlete is going to give a grand prize, uh, maybe some other prizes for certain types of uh, levels of entry. But basically, the grand prize is you get to go to dinner with this individual or you, you know, get to come to the game as is get whatever the, the case is. And basically, most of the time, a majority, if not a portion of it goes to charity as well. They partner with the charity. Hey, you know, 75 percent, 80 percent of this is going to charity. But basically, you know, you'll be able to buy five dollar entries, ten dollar entries to enter the chance to win that grand prize. And that's, and that's something we've, we've kind of built up and, and it goes really well. We've, we actually built that a lot up during COVID a ton of um, professional athletes wanted to kind of help raise money for different food banks and other type of things to help out, you know, people that were going through a hard time during COVID. So that was really cool. And the other thing we, we really do is a pop-up event. So these are going to be really cool. Unfortunately, during COVID, we had to kind of shut this all down, but we have a kind of a ticketing service and a ticketing, a ticketing um, kind of availability on through our site. So basically, if an athlete said, hey, I want to meet with fans for 30 minutes after your 
practice or on some random day to sign, you know, memorabilia, to shake hands, take pictures. I want, you know, this to be actually legit. Everyone who shows up, you know, has to pay for a ticket and, you know, we don't want to know who's coming and everything. Um, we can do that through this side as well. So we really are being able to sell these, these athletes on kind of a one-stop shop to really marketing yourself, kind of taking advantage of your entire name image likeness. And that's an appearance request that's, you know, wanting to do a cool experience request, you know, where you don't speak, but you do something else really cool or do a sweepstakes, a pop event all of the above. And so, yeah, there's going to be some really big names that we're going to mention pretty soon. And we're already doing deals for them. It's really, really fun. One of the things that I am sometimes critical of when former players, for instance, uh, are, are become personalities is whether or not they're going to give us insight into their experience as players. And that means not just telling us what was great, but what is in that locker room? Tell us yeah. about the ways in which it failed. Tell us about the ways in which you failed. Tell us the reasons why we should trust you on these issues. And I think that's one of the reasons that people really want to hear from former athletes. And the reason I'm putting it that way is you have had this experience as an athlete and building this business. So what are some of the pitfalls that you have seen that you have experienced in trying to figure out how to do this, meaning build engage, but also your individual experience of, Hey, what's legit? What's not. Uh, do I need a lawyer for this? Do I not? When do I need a manager or an agent to help me with these things? Those sorts of ideas. Yeah. So again, to the point of building a business, I mean, that's, it's been one of the more difficult things I've ever done. And very fortunately I've been, you know, around my manager who again, built this with me and a couple other friends and partners, um, you know, investors that have really just been workaholics with this. And it, it does, it does take workaholics. Um, Building business is not easy. So you definitely got to get in there, but you, relationships. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Leveraging relationships, just absolutely just putting your mind to it. I mean, it, everything about it is, 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 is worth it, but it's, it's tough. Now, in regards to actually being out there, making money off your name, image, likeness, and I, I've said this multiple times now, and I, I, I need everyone to kind of hear this if you're, if you're trying to do this. It's also a lot of hard work. You are going to have to juggle, obviously, those times you're trying to make money with be appearing somewhere, putting the time into do uh, pop events. Now, there's a couple of things. Obviously, sweepstakes doesn't take a ton of time, but you will have to put effort into that. Mm -hmm. And the money that comes in your bank account is great. And it's, it's rewarding, obviously. But like anything else in life, if you are doing, doing it purely for money, if you're going to do it purely just to see that, that number in your bank account rise, you are going to get one, really drained really fast. You're going to get burnout. But two, people are going to see right through that. There's, it, we kind of already mentioned this word before, but authenticity. People are going to know, hey, is this person just doing this for money or is this person doing it because they actually enjoy what they're doing? And that's where I say, Get a brand that is based off your passion, based off something you want to fight for. If that's, you know, social justice, justice, if that's you went through something as a child, poverty, you know, broken family, disease, whatever. You want to raise awareness for that. You want to talk about your experience going through adversity to, to inspire others. Whatever it is, you need to kind of have this central. I'm passionate about this. I This is my mission in life. This is something I get fulfillment off of. So therefore, I'm going to make money doing it as you sh you know should be able to, um, but you're also making a difference. And that's what's going to really put a smile and make you feel fulfilled when you lay your head down at nighttime. And that's going to be worth, hey, I know I just spent a lot of time preparing for this, doing a good job with this. And now I've got to come home and do an essay, make sure I pass my class. Oh, by the way, I still have meetings in the morning, a workout in the morning. All that stuff still applies. So you really need to make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. And money is never, ever the right reason if that's the sole reason you're doing it for. Yeah, man. I mean, you're, you're going to get found out. Like, you're going to find yourself out, if nothing else. And we're in a space, I think, that is very important and also very cool in that college is supposed to be about finding yourself and being about introspection, right? And yes. I'm, I'm always thrilled when I meet a kid that is willing to do that sort of work because so many adults haven't done it. Like they just <laughs> don't know who True. they are or what they believe and using name, image, and likeness as a vehicle to understand who you are and what you want your life to be about right. is as much, I think, important as trying to get to the NFL if we're talking about college football players. Right. 
So one of the things that I was looking at uh, in doing research for this interview was how your client list is kind of triple. And you guys are partnered with places like Rock Nation and Athletes First. Like, how are you hanging in, dog? <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's it's really it, COVID was one of the worst and best things for us. It was the worst thing because, you know, we we just finished re, uh kind of raising our pre-seed round. So we were, you know, sitting on cash and we didn't have any offices. We didn't have a lot of overhead. So when COVID shut everything down, we weren't too worried about, oh my gosh, you know, how are we going to continue to pay for all these expenses? We didn't have too many, but also our revenue source, our main revenue source, people getting booked for experiences now didn't exist. Mm. So we kind of were left with this, you know, in this balance of, hey, our main revenue source is now gone. But we do have the opportunity to take the next year, however long it was going to take, to really kind of get our ducks in a row um, and put a lot of effort into growing and gauges as, as much as we could. And the reason that was so successful is because for the first time in history, every talent, every agent was doing nothing. And so they were, <laughs> they were all ears. They were all worried. Hey, what's the next thing going to be if, you know, this whatever comes out of COVID? So when you come and, and basically say, hey, here's technology, which, by the way, you know, as, as an industry as a whole from you know, the world, uh, everything went towards technology. It really kind of uh, expedited that. So basically, everyone's like, yes, if this is a cool platform, we can continue to do things on during this, this pandemic, which, again, I told you between sweepstakes and a couple other things, we were able to kind of have people doing things. Um, this really was... I guess, you know, sugar in, in, in someone's mouth because it really was the option that they were looking for during this really uncertain downtime. And so that's how we kind of got in agency years. And of course, now when you start building up agencies and partnerships, now this agency is, oh man, they're, they're on that platform. We need our guys on that platform. We know they're on that platform. We got to get our guys on the platform. So it just kind of starts building up. So we really, really uh, went into in the COVID with about 350 talent on, and we were going to grow no matter what, but it really kind of expedited that process. And now we have over 2,200 guys on there. Goodness me, dog. Like that's phenomenal. And, and congrats because there are not a whole lot of people that have that story coming out of COVID. So that's very cool to hear. I want to pivot to you personally. So I'm going to ask this question. We'll see where it goes. What does the date September 2nd, 2017 mean to you? Man, it was it was just a more obviously one of the more important days of my life, one of the more happy days of my life. It was something that I really obviously worked my butt off to be able to do, um, and really built a team around me that were for me to prove to others that didn't think I could do it, um, you know, prove them wrong. But also, I think it's just such a sweet moment because, and, and I think this is something that's u- unique about my story. Um, is that, you know, at the age of 12, college and game day did that first piece on me. Um, and everyone saw me as a 12 year old going blind and everyone, you know, his heart was kind of, you know, wrenched and said, oh my gosh, here's this kid, you know, we're rooting for him now that he's, you know, now he's blind and trying to navigate this world. And then they did a couple of follow-up pieces and, you know, a piece a year later and then a piece in high school. And I started kind of playing football and people were like, oh my gosh, you know, here's that kid. Like, that's so cool. You know, he's doing well. I'm so glad to hear that. And then they did the piece when I first joined the USC, you know, Trojans as a freshman. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is actually really like full circle. This is so cool. You know, here's this kid who went blind and yada, yada, yada. And then that finally that day happened and like everyone in that call scene was crying because again, they, they, they had followed me. They prayed for me. They loved me. They supported me. They reached out, said, Hey Jake, you know, I'm here for you. So many people, not just obviously USC nation, but college football nation and sports nation as a whole really was there for me and and watched me grow up. And that's, that's the kind of resounding, um, I guess, message I hear from a lot of people when I meet them in airports or meet them on the street. I remember you as a little kid when you were out there with coach Carol, I'm so happy everyone kind of grew up with me and, and saw me overcome this, you know, um, cancer and blindness to the point where then I could go out there and actually showcase, you know, this, this, this triumph that I had and, and wanting to still live a life that was purposeful and meaningful to me. So I think that's why it was so important. And I, I, I it was just, everyone in that call scene was so overjoyed and on that day. And it's just something that I, I reflect on and I'm, I'm still so happy about. For those of you that do not know, that was the season opener for USC in 2017 when they played Western Michigan. And uh, 
Jake came in in the fourth quarter uh, as long snapper. And I think you lettered because of that, right? Is that? Is that uh, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, no, for sure. So I, that, that was uh, that was like my first of three snaps uh, that Crazy. I got in college. So. No, but like that's, I mean, and then that team finishes number three in the yep. Associated Press poll. I mean, not a whole hell of a lot of people say, A, they lettered play in college football. B, they played on a, <laughs> on a top three ranked team. And then, you know, like, we're, what, four years removed from that on September 2nd, and you are president of your company, and you're building this thing that is really outstanding. And I'm like, we are close to the same age, which is to say that I'm one of those people that was watching that piece and watching those follow-up pieces and read about the relationship that you had built with USC and Pete Carroll and was able to keep with USC throughout uh, the course of your life. So for you in particular, I find this question interesting. Do you feel a part of USC as a familial member in the way that many fans think they are? Yeah, I, I definitely do. I mean, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it's a, a really tight relationship I have with USC. I think that between, you know, the donors and the kind of people who've been there since way back and his family have real deep ties. I mean, everyone knows me. I'm, I'm, I'm the darling of, of USC football, I guess you could kind of say, but, um, definitely, Unfortunately, the USC has gone through a lot of change in the last couple of years between president and, and athletic director. And, you know, I, I support those guys over there. Um, but definitely it's 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 something that I, I want to be close with and support them. And I will I will die a USC Trojan fan and, and, and argue and defend them to, to the day I do die. But, you know, also as a family member, you got to kind of call out some things that are, are um sometimes wrong with the family and, and kind of put people back in, in, in line. And I think there's some things over at USC that we really need to change if we want to change the landscape of how we've been perceived over the last, you know, five to 10 years. Hey man, like I say this a lot as, as an Oklahoma fan, nobody's more critical of my team than me, period. <laughs> and it, it's always going to be that way because we know the most about the right. team, right? And yep. we don't see like, for instance, Oklahoma has won six consecutive conference championships. And I'm the guy going, yeah, but they haven't won a national championship right. in 18 years. I was 13. I turned 34 this month. Something's got to give here, right? So I understand what you're talking about when you say, hey, sometimes we're going to have to tell the truth, uh, tell the yeah. truth and tell it well, honest. Especially, especially being there for four years in the middle of that too. I mean, that gave me real insight into just how – how some things are. And, and now that I've had, you know, teammates transferred other places and they tell me the difference in certain things. I mean, it, it, there really does need to kind of, and this goes for college football as a whole, you know, I mean, this thing's getting real regionalized and there, there really does need to be these powerhouses and, and other parts of, of the, this country that need to really take the responsibility on of building back their programs. See, now you have tipped off something in my brain that I have wanted for a very long time. And I think I'm getting way ahead of many college football fans when I say these things, but I think name, image, and likeness can help us nationalize the sport. I do too. Go ahead. Why do you think that? No, I just think that, I mean, and I know it's not supposed to be this recruiting tool and, 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 you know, there's some obviously bylaws that still, you know, prohibit it from being a recruiting tool, but I do think, Hey, look, if you're a, if you're a college football player, right. Mm -hmm. And, or a college basketball player, um, which by the way, I, I mean, I, USC did very well in, in the men's basketball tournament this year, but um, I think, for Lakers and Clippers to be in LA and for you, I know UCLA has had obviously an outstanding basketball program, but if USC can't get an outstanding basketball program with, with these teams in LA and now with NIL, I don't know what's going to, what's it going to take, but <laughs> just as, as that kind of example, you have these huge markets now in LA and, and around the country. If that can't be exploited by a university to say, you need to come here, look at, look at all the supporters we have in LA, all these opportunities for you to, to kind of be in ties with, agencies and yada 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 i mean that's such a now a huge recruiting tool yeah man and like i was asked this the other day what is uh george klyovkov's first job and it was is it to turn in the pac-12 into the players conference he said no it's to redo the television deal and, and yeah. go make yes. some money that your your members can use to do these things that we're talking about like winning cures everything quite honestly yeah. but it does because we would all know where the pac-12 was playing football if they were having one national yep. championship the way the SEC does. But yes. that's another discussion. I think what I'm getting at when I say nationalization of the sport is 
I don't like how fragmented we are and how regionalized we are because I love college football, right? I have my team, you have your team, but I'm also the dude that's going to watch Tuesday night Mac football because I love the sport, right? I'm going right. to watch Akron and Eastern uh, Michigan play football because yes. I just want to see that. And the more we have an expanded playoff and the more we see name, image, and likeness go into national advertising, the more likely other people are to care about what's going on from coast to coast. And I use the NFL as an example here. There are a lot of Dallas Cowboys fans, right. but we all care what the Chargers are doing because right. that – also influences where we might be or who we might play in the playoffs or yep. who the Eagles might get, who absolutely can get this L every single time. I'm a, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, but that's the point, right? Is they were able to say, no, 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 we are the NFL in a way that we haven't been able to say that we are college football. And I right. think these things can really help us. Yeah, no. And I agree. And I think, you know, there's, for and I know I like obviously LA I'm 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 real high on because that's where yes. <laughs> left uh, hey, school. no don't begrudge you that not at all but you know it's like just look at where, where LeBron's last decision you know what what took him to join the Lakers well obviously I know the Lakers are a historic program but or a uh, team but it's just he wanted to be kind of around his 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 Hollywood and he wanted to be in his um you know movie making business and everything else so they're there and I know LA is not the only city that's going to offer some of these these um experiences and opportunities but i really think that there's going to be between you know miami um maybe places around Ch chicago new york mm -hmm. dallas like you saying um i mean i think there's gonna be real opportunities here for um uh, certain players and certain programs to highlight hey when this player was here you know 10 years they're gonna say hey, when this player was here in, in 2023 he did this you know you, you can be the next i mean look at what Reggie Bush and Matt Leiner could have done, right? Like that would have been just insane. So I really do think there's some cool opportunities here. And like I said, uh, besides the NIL stuff, you know, hopefully maybe some uh, revision in the, in the playoff format could also help this regionalized uh, position. But I, I really do think that NIL is going to maybe break some of that ice off. Yeah. And I, and I can't wait to see what that looks like, because I mean, as you mentioned with LeBron, I mean, Braun is his motion picture studio and they've right. been putting out some really amazing work here. I mean, like they're successful in, in an industry that it's really difficult to be successful in, right? Like right. you, you got to quadruple your money to say that you made a good picture according to some standards. And that's on top of being a world-class basketball player. And I always tell people, Michael Jordan was doing this. You just didn't right. pay attention or, or you didn't have Twitter to tell you what he was doing. Right. Magic Johnson was doing this and even in baseball. Right. Like we, we could keep going about it, but I think you and I are of one mind on this. So immediately, like, what do you think is the next hurdle for name, image and likeness? Is it simply trying to keep this train on the rails and nothing goes wrong? Or is there something else you're waiting on? Yeah, I think, and I've seen some kind of scary stuff already with certain contracts, trying to get players to commit all money they make for the next at lifetime to certain agencies, yada, yada, yada. So I really think there needs to be a lot of uh, great advice and, and real type of leadership here with certain people. And I'm, I'm trying to kind of be that person. And my partner, Daniel is trying to be that person with advising a lot of these, these athletes, either if we represent them or not, but just saying, Hey, make sure what's coming in is legit. It's transparent. Um, it, these people that you are trying to maybe partner with or want to do something with you have the best, uh, have, have you in mind and want the best for you. So we really need to make sure that these, these deals and processes are that are going on are legit. And like I said, are the best for the players. Jake Olson is the president of engage an online platform that is connecting the people you want to hear from the people you want to experience things with, with those experiences and ways to hear them. Jake, thank you so much for the time, man. This has been a lot of fun. All right, RJ, let's, uh, Let's just make sure either our Sooners or Trojans make sure we beat uh, Clemson and Bama this year, huh? Hey, man, from your mouth to his ears, like that's <laughs> what I'm hoping for. Thanks so much, buddy. All right, Jay. My thanks to Jake Olson for joining us for what I thought was an insightful conversation. Hopefully you, hopefully you learned some things about name, image, and likeness and one way in which the kids will be able to monetize just who they are. And I hope use this time to figure out what happens after they, well, quit playing the sport that they play? 
whether that be professionally or in college. But from that, I want to talk about the kids that are coming in. So this list for this episode is the recruiting storylines you need to know. And there's a bunch, but we stuck with five. And I kind of want to hit them as we go. And the first one at the top, it's got to be JT, Tui Maloal, and Jack Sawyer are on the same defensive line. Both are at Ohio State. It also means that depending on how you want to break this thing up, I know that Ohio State fans are fond of saying that they got five out of the top 10 players in the 2021 class. It's not actually true. They got five of the top 10 from the top 247, which is 247's in-house own rankings. It's not the composite. And here at Fox, we use the composite to denote who the best players are, which is another way of saying Pac-12 actually picked up the number one player in the country in 2021. Quiet as it's kept, Corey Foreman is at USC. But JT and Jack are two bookends that I am very excited to see because we were robbed of Chase Young and Nick Bosa bookending an Ohio State defensive line. This feels like it could be, if not the next best thing, a better thing. So I'm very excited to see what those dudes look like in a couple of years. And we'll see how quickly JT acclimates to Ohio State and its way of doing things because Jack Sawyer's been on campus since January. And I saw him in the spring game and he was the best player in it. So if JT is even that good, goodness me, Larry Johnson Sr.'s room is about to be just nasty all over again. But that's something we've been saying about Larry Johnson Sr.'s room for the better part of a decade, okay? Like Chase Young, Nick Bosa, Joey Bosa, they all come out of there, right? Like it, it, it's getting kind of just disgusting in that defensive line room. So much so that just pencil in the best Ohio State defensive lineman as a first round draft pick because that is how he is developing them. And their hands, man, they got them karate hands. They be kung fu fighting with them hands. I'm telling you, between them and Aaron Donald, those hands are lethal weapons. I'm just putting that out there. The next storyline you need to know about, right, is Cade Klubnik and Quinn Ewers. Or, look, this wraps into NIL deals too. But the way that I'm putting this, start with Cade Klubnik and Quinn Ewers. Both of those dudes have been competing against each other for the better part of three years. Klubnik coming out of Austin Westlake and Quinn Ewers coming out of South Lake Carroll. Quinn Ewers, as you'll know if you listen to this show, is only the sixth ever player to receive a 1.000 ranking from the 247 Sports Composite. I will be curious to see if he keeps that. I don't think that he will. Mostly because Kay Klubnik has been blowing him up. First, in December, in the 6A2 state championship game in which Cade led his team over the top of Quinn Ewer's team to the state championship. And then recently in Elite 11, I had said, I thought that Quinn Ewer's was going to win Elite 11. Okay, I was wrong. Cade Klubnik won Elite 11, which means that Cade Klubnik is 2-0 against Quinn Ewer's recently. This also comes at a really interesting point in which Arch Manning is beginning to take his visits and start taking in all these experiences that are going to be available to him as the number one player and quarterback in the class of 2023. If Kay Klubnik is able to capitalize on these NIL deals in the way that I think that Quinn Ewers will be because Ohio State's fan base is just gargantuan, you're going to see another wave of this and it's going to come straight to Dabo Sweeney's door. And that is something that I am rooting for. But as the name, image, and likeness deals are wrapping into pay for play, it can make college football a destination sport. And if you know that you're going to probably be the most profitable that you or most valuable, I should say, that you'll be in your entire life during college football, you might take into account where you're going to go play. What are those opportunities that lay for you? Like, I know Miami is going to be ahead of the curve on this. I know Nebraska is going to try to use this to get back into where they think Nebraska should be. But I'm also taking a look at places like LSU, where to recruit Corey Foreman, they had local business that did not approach LSU about this putting his name up on the marquee. They are in on this, okay? You have local markets that have been waiting for this opportunity for a very, very long time. And you're going to see businesses and learn about businesses you never thought existed before. Like, I can't wait for the propane and propane accessories to make a play for the number one player in the whatever class as he is going to signing. Like, is this going to influence whether or not you go to NBC to make your announcement 
at the all america game it's all going to be very interesting okay the next one that i really want to talk about is jordan hudson becoming the highest rated recruit in smu history okay so backstory here is jordan hudson was committed to oklahoma's 2022 class wide receiver out of garland texas a four-star recruit ranked number 113 in the country good get for anybody a couple weeks ago he decommitted from Oklahoma and listed among his top three, Texas, Alabama, and Southern Methodist. I thought that Southern Methodist was the outlier here. Like, I'm going, are you just putting down the hometown school because that's what you do? Because Texas Christian would love to have that spot and get some love there. So I'm thinking, yeah, probably going to go to Texas, right? And what a boon it would have been for Texas to steal one back from Oklahoma in the way that, say, Oklahoma stole Billy Bowman from Texas, right? Because he decommitted and then flipped to Oklahoma where he's probably going to play both ways. Then the man surprises us all with committing to Southern Methodist. He is now the highest rated recruit ever to pick Southern Methodist in the rankings era. That is a tremendous win. It also is a signal. Y'all will know there was a certain documentary made by a four-letter network called Pony Excess about just what Southern Methodist was willing to do to win football games. And a lot of it had to do with, as I said in the monologue, Sherwood Blood saying, we got a payroll to meet. Do you have some folks over there that would like nothing more than to stamp their bank, their law firm, their oil company on some of these players in an effort to recruit them? to give them outstanding internships. And by outstanding, I'm talking about the OJ's version of outstanding. Do you feel me yet? I'm talking about got to have it, mean green. Need to have it, mean green. Like that's what it's about to be in Texas because Texas does oil, Texas does all sorts of things very well. And it's a business economy, like it's, like Oklahoma fashions itself after Texas. Like we open for business too up here. So I can't wait to see who is willing to pony up. And when we learn what some of these internships are going to pay, when we learn what some of these endorsement deals are going to pay, just not going to check anybody that Southern Methodist, that Texas Christian, that Baylor is actually, you know, a top 10, top five perennial because that's what it's going to take. And that's where we're heading. Now, I want this thing to stay on the rails, but I'm already sure that we're going to see some stuff out there that we're going, yikes, dog. Like, did you think that that was going to go well? Because we're dealing with teenagers who have become adults, right? And I think that they deserve the same opportunity to make mistakes that we did. Like, a lot of y'all out here are acting kind of funny, okay? A lot of y'all acting kind of funny on this when you say, well, I want them to pay taxes. All of a sudden, you want people to pay taxes? Because it's usually the people out there that are saying that they don't want to pay taxes trying to get these children to pay taxes. I'm just saying, you know, it don't feel like you're on the bandwagon that is pushing towards socialism. Okay? Don't feel like that. Feel like you want your money to stay in your pocket too. And we have somebody that's their job to go and make sure you pay taxes. It's called Iris. You know Iris? You know Iris. You know, you know the revenue man. Yeah, you know Iris. Anyway, Iris will be at your door running audits on you, and it ain't your job to make sure they pay taxes. That is Iris's job, and Iris always gets hers, okay? You can try to dodge Iris, but ask Wesley Snipes about dodging Iris. Hell, ask Will Smith about dodging Iris. That You don't dodge Iris. She come get you, because you owe her, all right? I need y'all to start worrying about what these children are doing with their money, because ain't nobody coming to you with your stimulus check talking about Yo, what are you doing buying all this GameStop stock? No, what are you doing buying a new TV? Ain't you got a bill to pay? Hey, mind your business. That's what we're saying about all of this. Mind your business, okay? Be happy that somebody is out there getting theirs, just like USC, which leads me to the last storyline you got to know about in recruiting. USC, as I had written in May, and y'all wanted to lambast me for, is building toward power. Okay, they are getting back to who they were. It wasn't that long ago they finished number three in the country in the Associated Press poll. Why am I the only person saying this? And then all you got to do is take it with their, not just recruiting, but who they recruiting out of the portal. Like, it ain't, a, it, ain't, it ain't a stretch. It ain't a stretch at all to say that they have recruited four starters 
from the Texas football program in the last six months. And that's not even counting Brew McCoy. They just landed Jake Smith, who was the 2018 National Gatorade Player of the Year coming out of Arizona, okay? White Chocolate got some moves over there. I can't wait for Graham Harrell to put the ball in that boy's hands. I want him to be healthy, but he is going to be a menace, as is Brew McCoy. And then you got Keontae Ingram back there. You got Xavier Alford on the other side, and you got big old 6'6", 250-pound Malcolm Epps running wire routes opposite Jake Drake London. It's about to be a whole situation down there in Coliseum, okay? I almost said Pasadena. That was, I almost said it, but I didn't say it. You saw it. I caught it. I caught it. I said Coliseum. See, uh, we, got a, we got a USC alum that directs the show, and I'm, I'm sure that he would have come unglued. And I, hey, hey, Cheshire, I caught it. I caught it. But now that you know that USC is really good at this roster management thing, and they are able to recruit around name, image, and likeness, as Jake was pointing out, there is no excuse for USC to not land the kids that they want. That being said, as the kids say, after, you know, when they say all the platitudes and then they get to the that being said, that's the part that you always want to know. That being said, DJ Uy Ungalale went across the country to play football after playing in St. John Bosco. <clears throat> JT Daniels left USC to go to Georgia where they opt to challenge for a national championship. Okay? Like, we can keep looking up and down California and going, yo, that kid went where? And you're going to do that. Like, CJ Stroud, who... Many of us believe will be the starting quarterback at Ohio State. We'll wait and see. He come out of Rancho Cucamonga. And this is one of those situations where uh, we got people that, that, that look at things through a different gaze. If I say Rancho Cucamonga to a few of y'all, y'all be like, oh, okay, cool, California. I say Rancho Cucamonga to a few of y'all. Hey, RG with the next Friday reference. You, you see it. You see it. You see it. CJ from Rancho Cucamonga, California. That made me so happy. That made me so, like... When I learned that three years ago, I can't tell you how giddy I was. <laughs> we get to reference Rancho Cucamonga in national discourse for at least two years now. I'm so excited about that. I'm also excited about what USC is choosing to do with roster management and what these Ohio State ends are going to look like. This budding, dueling affair between Ewers and Klubnik, which is going to look a lot like I think Uwe Ungulale and Daniels when Clemson, Georgia play each other. This year, that's one I'm really looking forward to. And SMU on to come up, landing its all-time greatest recruit in the rankings era. Outstanding stuff. So now, I want to do the We Out Ya segment, which is where you tell me what you generally think lately about my all-time list. I haven't seen too many of y'all come back at me with y'all all-time list. Y'all just want to pick fights with me. However, two things I do, well, I say three things I actually want to talk about. First of all, Chris got in here with the USC comment because I was, you know, I told y'all that I called myself saying Pasadena. He's like, yo, when we play at Pasadena, you know, it's basically a home game. So UCLA fans, do something with that. I'm saying, like, use that. Use that energy, okay? Give that energy out. If that makes you into a Super Saiyan Blue, let's do that, right? You, you're not going to get to Brawley. Not not this scene. Not, not really. Anyway, I also want to make reference to uh, a couple of dudes that we put on the graphic that had some things to say. Jonathan Allen saying, hey, look, it's very cool. That he was included. I mean, you know you all time great, dog. And then Michael Orr just not taking any truck with my graphic. Talking about my list is accurate. I'm with that. I appreciate that, Michael. Blind side, stay up, bro. And then Pat Sertan's daddy, that is the Pat Sertan, got in there and be like, no, my son definitely is supposed to be on that list. And anybody that knows football knows that Patrick Sertan is the best football player to come out of my mama's alma mater. And my mama's alma mater is Southern Miss. And Brett Favre, you got something to say? We welcome you to the number one ranked show. You can say it right here on the show, okay? Patch of 10. He the best player ever to come out of Southern Miss and play for the Golden Eagles. All right, and then, you know, Brock Vandegrift's dad got in here with some tight end stuff that we're going to talk about. But shout out to Greg, who is a phenomenal person, and it was very kind to me when I was trying to interview and get a hold of his kiddo during his launch in recruiting with... OU giving him an offer like years ago. He's at Georgia. I expect him to be great. I hope on reserve is, you know, writing a really thick check for you and the family. Now, I want to bring in producer Cat, a.k.a. S.E.C. Catherine, uh, who pulled some responses. And let's see what you got, producer Cat. I'm going to start with 
uh, the one that you mentioned first, mm. from, and this is from Vandergriff's dad, so it's at G Vandergriff. RJ, you know the SEC runs the ball as well. Who is the tight end in this offense asking for a friend? Jason Witten? Many others. Let me know. All right. As I told Greg, I have 11 positions. Okay. And I have Herschel Walker and Bo Jackson flanking Cam Newton in my split back. I have Devontae Smith, Jamar Chase on the numbers, and I got Julio Jones in the slot. Okay. This is what I like to call over here in Coach Young's coaching philosophy and playbook the six God offense. Okay. Okay. We run the six God because each one of these men is one of the six gods, which is to say, when we put the ball into a running back stomach, we looking for six. When we throw the ball to any one of these wide receivers, we looking for six. And if the play breaks down, and somehow you sniffed out the play that we running, and you called the great counter defense, my man's Cam Newton, all six foot five, two fifty, can break your tackles and not get me out of trouble, not escape the pocket. He can go get me a bucket. He can go get me six. Okay, and I am load. To take off either one of those running backs and either one of those wide receivers so that I can satisfy somebody's need to use a tight end. I don't need a sixth offensive lineman. I don't need a matchup nightmare. I got that. I got three of those at wide out. I got two of those at tailback. But if I were to pick a tight end, I wouldn't pick a tight end anyway. I'd pick Kyle Pitts. Okay? Because he ain't no tight end. You know why he ain't no tight end? Because I can line that man up on the numbers. I can put that man in the backfield. Look, he was so good in high school that his coaches wanted him to play quarterback. And he said, I'm a tight end. So they said, get down a three-point stance. And he made one of them TPs. Some of y'all know play football. Y'all know what the TP is. And they told him he'll never make it as a tight end. Hurt his feelings. He told his mama. His mama asked what you want to do. He transferred to another school where they said, you can play anything you want as long as you play defense. I don't, I don't care. And what does that man become but like the sixth highest paid tight end in the in NFL right now because of where he was drafted. He should have gone in as a wide receiver because the slotted value is more. But I don't have no need for no Jason Witten. I don't really have a need for OJ Howard or Irv Smith for that matter. Okay. All I need is them three and them two and Cam Newton running my scheme. Cam, what you want to do? That's that's going to be my play call. It's going to run it, Cam, because that's all we're doing. We're getting six, right? We're going for a buck 80 every game. Produce Cat, what else you got? There were a ton of people that asked about this specific player, so I just, like, picked one. Okay. <laughs> um, one person that commented on this. So this is from at Caleb P. Jordan. And he says, you have Sertan over the honey badger with the, like a million questions. Okay, first of all, uh, Pastor Tan's daddy came through and said, no, no, no. My son needs to be on this team. And many of you will know, Pat Sertan Sr. is one of the best corners to ever play the game of football. Okay, to say nothing of American Heritage is like nationally ranked. Like he's, he's a hell of a head football coach too, where he also trained his son along with others like Tyson Campbell and even more. But to your Tieran Matthew argument over here, I'm not going to put a player on my team who was not indispensable and was kicked off of his own team. Okay? Anybody that can't finish the year on their own roster ain't going to make mine. Like, that's just full stop. I, I ain't doing that. And I don't need a honey badger. I got three dudes that can cover everybody on the team, and I can run single coverage, or sorry, I can say run single high safety with Eric Berry. Okay? Because I know what you're going to try to do. You're going to try to take advantage of me on the outside, and I'm not going to let you. Because I got the only Alabama player ever to win Defensive Player of the Year at corner. And Pat Sertan. But more to the point, I could say, talk about Champ Bailey, I could talk about Pat Peterson, but I'm, I'm pointing to this on Pat Sertan. In the 2020 Rose Bowl, this man, Brian Kelly, got up in front of God, his church, and a national television broadcast and said, 
I have told Ian Book, you are not throwing at Pat Sertan the second in a college football playoff game. They refused to even test that man. That is a corner. That is the epitome of a cover corner. You are so good. We refuse to challenge the half of the field you're on. And he won Rose Bowl defensive MVP because I'm sure of that statement in public on national television. I love me some Patrick Tan. Also, the man was on my show. A lot of y'all won't be on my show. A lot of y'all said no to my show. Patrick Tan showed up to my show and was cool about it. Okay? Nah. We, we over here ride for Patrick Tan. And then shout out to Javion who also was like, yo, RJ, Patrick Peterson. Which also gets me into this discussion about players that I couldn't put on. But we'll have to save that for later. Produce Cat, what else you got? All right. This last one is from at TMath underscore A. I think Derrick Henry has to be on the offense. His 2015 was one of the best SEC rushing seasons ever. Had more yards and touchdowns on less carries than Herschel. No fluke either. It continued in the NFL. Dude is bigger than ever than everyone and did just as fast as, as the little guys. Do not come to me telling me about what somebody did in the NFL to justify your college football argument. But we'll put that over there. I am not going to take off the first dude to ever start as a red shirt freshman at Georgia. Or the man who quite literally carried them for three years so that you can have Derrick Henry. I also think that Derrick, like, this is also, like, part of the part of the issue here is I have an all-time top 10 of college football players, right? So what do I look like not putting the dudes that made my top 10 on my all-SEC team? I'm kind of locked into that, okay? I'm not going to change my mind on this because – there are only a few rules in like this format, sports talk radio, sports talk podcast, sports television, sports media. And one of them is you better change your mind when there's brand new information that you can't back away from. Because once you put down an opinion, if you change your opinion, people are going to treat you like John Kerry running for president. It ain't going to go well. There's actually a college football cop to that. That man went into Ohio and said he you know, was for the Buckeyes, and then went across the line to Michigan and said he was for the Wolverines. Like, 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 like we didn't, like, he on TV? Like, somebody wouldn't catch that? Like, you can't do that, man. Like, I'm an Oklahoma fan everywhere I go. Now, we can have this discussion about whether Oklahoma fans think that, but point is, nah, man, I can't put Derrick Henry there. I, I can't do it. I can't do it. But again, you chose to pick a fight about one player. Here's the other thing that produced cat. I need your I need I need your insight on this. Did you see anybody at all have anything at all to say other than the offensive lineman that is Michael Orr about the offensive line? Okay. Not from the responses I okay. read. No. I thought I thought these were football fans. Cause last time I checked, you're not gonna be any good without an offensive line. I mean, just ask Jackson State about that. They got skill players out the wazoo, dudes. You know. You need an offensive line. So the fact that nobody wanted to argue about this offensive line really hurts my feelings. Because if all we're doing is putting on seven on seven, then let's put on seven on seven. But don't come to me talking about these skill players. Okay? Football fan. All right, Producer Cat, you got anything left? I think you just about covered it. Okay. I got one. I got to get it. And then we can wrap the show. I had some folks that wanted to show up and talk noise about my defensive line. I'm happy to report nobody wanted to go at your man's Reggie White. Otherwise, we would have had, you know, we'd have had to throw these hands. There are people that really wanted to go at Glenn Dorsey, who just don't know that Glenn Dorsey was that team. But also, like, wanted to put Nick Fairley on the team. Like, all right, I kind of see what you're doing over there. And then we had people that was trying to get Jonathan Allen off who got Heisman votes. And I'm like, nah, man. Plus, the man came through, right? And we argue a little bit about Quentin Williams. But the dude I refuse to let you come at me about is Kentucky's Josh Allen. Okay? Josh Allen 
had a better 2018 than Chase Young had 2019. Now, Ohio State fans, before you get into your feelings about this, I am making the point to contextualize just how good Josh Allen is at playing defensive end. It's also to really get back at you when you were talking about in 2019, who is this dude that the Jaguars are drafting? I'll tell you who this dude is that the Jaguars were drafting. They were drafting a man who had 88 tackles, 21 and a half tackles for loss, and 17 sacks in one season of football. He played end. He damn near got 100 tackles at end. Plus 21 and a half tackles for loss. It's 17 sacks at Kentucky, which is a weak SEC team playing an SEC schedule. Do you hear what I'm saying? Your man is Chase Young, who I thought was the best player in 2019. Had 21 tackles for loss, 16 and a half sacks, and just 46 tackles. Now, the Ohio State fans are very quick to say, yo, man, he missed three games. Okay, he missed three games first because it's his own fault. He, he ain't missing due to injury, okay? And, and, you try and tell me that man go pick up 40 tackles in three games? At end? Ain't no way! And he playing the Big Ten. Now, as much as I love the Big Ten, I'll say it. The East is way better than the West. Indiana has basically put a nail in that. Okay? Now, it could shift. But Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, Michigan State, Rutgers, Indiana, Maryland, they all could play a little football. Okay? Coming out of the West, Wisconsin, Iowa. We need Nebraska to be good for us to actually start talking well about the Big Ten West. Uh, Nebraska, I'm begging you. Be good, baby. Be, be good. It's good for the sport. Nebraska, Arkansas, come home. Come to the Big 12. Come home. You ain't supposed to be over there. You know that. But on my point about Josh Allen, I'm just not going to let y'all have that. Josh Allen was a man among men. You just played at Kentucky. Because if he had these doggone numbers at Florida, LSU, Alabama, y'all wouldn't have shut up about it. We'd have, we'd have never heard it. Hell, if he'd have played at Tennessee, we would have never heard the end of it. Okay? Y'all better give that man his flowers. All right. That is going to do it for this episode of the number one ranked show. But since you're still here, I get to tell y'all a bit of news. The crew, that's right, the crew is headed to Big 12 Media Days. That is next. Well, you're... You're hearing this on Monday. So that is Wednesday and Thursday. And your boy gets to sit down with the coaches and the players. And we are going to have one hell of a good time. I promise. I promise it's going to be fun. I promise these are two podcasts next week you're not going to want to miss. That's right, two. We about to ratchet up the schedule here a little bit. Y'all about to get what you've been asking for, which is more of the quote-unquote content. Okay? And since we are in the content business, we're going to give you more content. It's going to be a rockish July. Also, my birthday is July 31st. I'm taking all the birthday wishes you want to give me at number one show on IG, Facebook, Twitter. I'm also here to tell y'all that the Leos are the greatest. <clears throat> That's right. It's just us. We have, I'm, I'm being, what I'm saying is if we come off as arrogant, it's because we just need you to, to let us process. And please feel free to give us a pep talk. You know, pet us. We, we really want to be well. We want to do well. We're lions. But even lions need, you know, zoo keepers. You know? Like, so if you see, find yourself around a Leo, just know, yo, that, let that man be. Let it get his mane out. Okay? If you pet him, everything's fine. I'm learning that about myself. Going through some therapy. Uh, partner is doing the whole Zodiac charting thing. We're going to figure out some things about ourselves because she thinks I got, like, way too much Aries over here. You know, I'm going to just end the show. Deuces.